Hello, my name is Katie. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. It's been a couple of weeks since I posted. I'm just a little bit, a little bit busy these days. So there are going to be a couple of changes. Um, so let's just, let's just get into it. First things first, I'm going to like stop with the stat stuff for now. It's not... It's just a little bit more time consuming, not even just in terms of prep, but also in editing. And right now I just have other things that are making demands on my time. And so I need to be able to, to keep this filming, editing, upload process as, as tightly and compact, I guess, as I can in order to continue to do this. Otherwise I'm going to need to take like a hiatus. Um, I'm probably also going to just continue with my couple uploads a month. Um, for sure I'll be doing wrap-ups. Most likely I'll be doing TBRs, although I'm starting to feel like that's limiting uh, my, my reading and I, I'm not loving that. So we'll see going forward um, if I continue to do them. I kind of like to do them just because it's fun, even if I don't totally stick to it. Um, and then the other thing is I might have like a couple of other random videos that I throw in during the month, just depending on, on what kind of a t uh, time I have. I'll be doing a book haul eventually, probably not till April. I have an unhaul that I'm probably going to be doing in the next month as well. I have a video that I've prepped but haven't filmed about nonfiction books that make me laugh. And then I have just, um kind of an idea for a discussion video that I haven't quite figured out yet. So those are some things that m should be coming, um, but they're going to be kind of spread out just because, like I said, I have other things making demands on my time right now, and I just, I'm starting to feel overwhelmed, and it's making the quality of everything I'm doing, um, like, diminished. So anyway, now that we have that out of the way, let's just go ahead and get into the books I read in February. I read 15 books last month, and 15 sounds like a lot, but four of them were like middle grade, so it wasn't as time consuming as it otherwise would have been. So we'll just start with those, because I don't, I don't rate these, because they're not written for me, um, so... Anyway, I read uh, the one on Victoria. This, this was great. This was so funny. Um, this one's by Anna Kerwin. And then, let me see. I think, yes, this one is also by Anna Kerwin. Um, Lady of Palenque? I, I meant to look this up, and I totally didn't. I'm sorry. Um, but <laughs> Victoria was by far the funniest out of the four that I read this month. And, like, I already know a good deal about Queen Victoria because I've read, like, biographies and things like that. Um, she's a pretty popular royal figure, so I already knew quite a bit about her. Since I already mentioned this one, this, uh, uh, Lady of Palenque, Flower of Bacall, this was, uh, Mesoamerica. I don't know much about that time and that place. So this was actually pretty cool. I love, my favorite part of these is in the back. They have like a historical note and then they have like some photos that not are they're not always of the, the person in question. Sometimes they're just like this is what's left of this palace or this is a map of the area, things like that. But then they'll also have like glossaries sometimes or like a cast of characters type of deal where they go through and tell you who is the actual people, who they made up to fit with the story and then they also have um, family trees where they can get them. So that was really interesting. I learned a lot from this one. I read Sonduk, Princess of the Moon and Stars. This was by Sherry Holman, I believe. This was quite good too. Um, I, I didn't know really anything about the Korean royal family. So I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed reading this one. This one probably had the most plot to it out of all these, usually they're just very character driven, but this one had like an actual plot and I was like, I gotta know, I can't wait to see what happens. So this one was really fun. And then finally I read Mary Queen of Scots. This was by Catherine Lasky and I enjoyed this one a lot too. I tend to like the ones that Catherine Lasky does. I believe she also did um, the one on Queen Elizabeth and I, I enjoyed this one quite a bit. I already knew a decent bit about Mary Queen of Scots, so that made this one a little bit easier to read as well. I only have one book left, 
in the Royal Diaries series, and I'm very much looking forward to it. It is about a Native American princess. Well, I, I'm using the term princess kind of loosely here, but basically that that's that's what they're driving at. So I will hopefully be finishing that up in March, and then, then I've read the whole series. I'm really excited to have finally gotten through all these. I honestly can't wait to have children and read these with them. I think it's going to be so much fun. Okay, so hopping into the other books that I read this month, nothing was bad. Um, <laughs> I basically enjoyed everything I read, so that's cool. The lowest rated book I have, this is a 3.5 star, this is White Ivy by Susie Yang. This was my um, Asian author pick for the month of February, and this was weird. This is one of those situations where this book is not going to be for everybody because the main character is so very unlikable and it gets extremely dark, darker than I expected it to go. So Ivy is the daughter of immigrants. She herself lived in China until she was five and then her parents had finally been able to save up enough money to have her come, you know, live with them. She'd been living with her grandmother up till that time. And then when she arrives in America, like, she has a surprise baby brother and stuff. So how, like, her beginnings versus what her brother had in, like, young childhood, very, very different. Um, so there's some issues there. And then Grandma eventually comes to live with the family as well. Um, this is really a story of immigrants and how things can be very, very difficult. Um, so... In that respect, I think it was well done. See, the thing here is Ivy wants to be wealthy. Um, her grandmother kind of teaches her to steal, but she steals, she doesn't steal indiscriminately. She steals from like yard sales and things like that. Like it's, it's very bizarre how she does it, um, but she has like a code of ethics for her stealing. <laughs> but Ivy, Ivy does not. And, um, <laughs> This gets exacerbated when she ends up going to school at this very wealthy, like, private school. Her dad works there um, in some capacity, so that's how she's able to get in. And she sees these wealthy people, and she just aspires to be like them. And she starts lying to her parents and yada, yada, yada. So they send her to China to spend a summer. And then she comes back, and her family has moved. So she is no longer living in the same Massachusetts town, they're living in New Jersey, whole new school, whole new dynamic, but she's never forgotten um, about that area. So later on in life she winds up going to school, in like college in that area, and then living there. And it's very interesting um, how that all shakes out. And then she comes into contact with a family she knew from school. She was, oh, I think it's fair to say she was obsessed. Uh, with the teenage boy in that family. He is an adult now, obviously, and they they meet up again. So it it's it's very very interesting. Um, I I abhorred Ivy. Like she was not a good person, but she was very interesting to read about. Okay, next we have a 3.75 star read, and that was Mrs. March by Virginia. Feito? F-E-I-T-O? You should see the cover. Hopefully I put it up here. Um, I actually forgot that I read this book this month. <laughs> so it wasn't a bad book. I thoroughly enjoyed myself at the time, but it's a very forgettable book. So take that as you will. So I think what the author was going for here, and I, I, I suspect I'm right, and I'll, I'll explain, is I think she was trying to write this story in the style of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. And at one point she indeed actually has the main character reading Rebecca. So that, that was interesting. We just know her by Mrs. March throughout the entire book. And even when they're talking about her as like a baby, they're still calling her Mrs. March. It's very bizarre. And because of things like that, you really start realizing that this woman doesn't have a name. Whereas when I was reading Rebecca, I never quite realized that the main character was never called anything other than Mrs. De Winter. Um, so it just wasn't as smoothly done here. Second thing is that Mrs. March has extreme anxiety and she has like paranoid delusions. 
And it was to the point that it was setting me on edge. I was getting anxious while I was reading it. So maybe tread cautiously um, because of that. And then the other thing that kind of I felt was weird was that reading it, I could never quite figure out what time it was set in. At times it felt very old. Like, you know, they were still answering the phone that was on the wall and she has these green gloves that she wears. But then at other times it felt fairly modern. So I just really don't know uh, how I fall on that one. Anyway, to give you like a very brief synopsis, because this is one of those where I feel like the less you know the better, um, Mrs. March, her husband, is an author. He's quite a bit older than her, but he, he writes this book and it's being hailed as like his best work ever. And somebody like very innocently suggests that he based the main character on his wife. But the main character in Mrs. March's eyes is deplorable. She's abhorrent. She's essentially how it was described basically is she is a whore that is so ugly that people pay her not to have sex with them. <laughs> now, Mrs. March is a very unreliable narrator, so whether or not that's the truth uh, with the novel, I, I don't know. But that's, that's that story. Okay. Moving on to Four Star Reads. The first book I have on here is The Sister's Suite by Elizabeth Weiss. This is a book um, basically uh, about these two sisters. They are twins and they are born into a family of performers. Now things have happened and their parents are no longer really performing but they aren't having an easy time making ends meet. Their father just loves that world and he loves to design sets and he loves to like be a, like a visionary when it comes to creating things that other people have only dreamed of. If that is making any sense at all. Um, so he tries to have them do like a sister act, but it, it doesn't go very far because there's a lot of that happening. So instead he comes up with this idea to pretend that they are Siamese twins and that they are connected like at the arm. So he has this harness that he puts them in and he makes them like double wide clothes. And so they're just like basically stuck together. Like their arms are attached to their sides so they can't go anywhere. And then they teach them these dances and these songs and they they learn to move together and it's really it's really cool actually how how they manage it but um eventually they are caught out and then the sisters go their separate ways and that's kind of how the book starts is a reporter or maybe she's writing a book I can't remember which she comes and she is knocking on the door of the one sister and she's trying to get information on the other sister who wound up being a famous Hollywood actress very very interesting um, it takes place before the Great Depression and then you see what happens to the family and their sister act during the depression and how difficult it is for them to get um, hired on for various troops because that's not like people don't have money to go see shows really anymore so that's the thing they wind up with um her mother's brother-in-law it's very very complicated uh so there's a lot of family dynamic happening and you do get different points of view it's not just the one sister. We also get points of view from the, the parents and stuff like that. Very good book. I had an excellent time reading it. Okay, this was a buddy read with one of my subscribers. Her name is Eden. We had a great time with it. Um, the spinning magnet, the electromagnetic force that created the modern world and could destroy it by Alana Mitchell. So there are a couple of things here. Um, first of all, you can tell that the author is a journalist and not a scientist. But she does a very good job of taking the rather simplistic explanations given to her and translating them into a very readable and understandable work. I have taken lots of science classes in the last two years, so I am fairly up on things, like I remember a lot, but Eden hadn't taken science classes in a long time, and we seemed to be able to comprehend what was going on fairly equally. What was a problem, though, was that it tended to get a little bit 
repetitive, um, which is, it is what it is. Uh, I still recommend the book. I had a really good time with it. The information was fascinating. It was cool because it takes what I know about like physics and just like mechanics, like how the world works. And this electromagnetic force is kind of like the piece of the puzzle that I needed to put the two concepts together. So in that way, it was absolutely phenomenal. But this is basically like a history of science type of situation. And I liked it, but also it gave me another thing to be afraid of. <laughs> so in that respect, um, you know, maybe be careful if you're already like panicking about things like climate change. Probably don't read this because it's just going to give you another world ending catastrophe to think about. Okay, my last four star read, The Mothers by Britt Bennett. I really enjoyed this. Okay, so this is my second book by Britt Bennett. This was her debut, but I also read The Vanishing Half. I actually read that first. And of the two, I think I prefer The Vanishing Half. But this was also great. The Mothers is referring to this group of elderly women who attend this church. They call them the Mothers. They there's a lot of like they gossip but they also are the ones who will help you set up a funeral who will bring you food if you are ill that kind of a thing they very much look out for the congregation they are the mothers it's told from their like collective point of view it's it's very hard to explain but as you're reading it it's not complicated at all and they're telling the story of these three teens we have nadia aubrey and luke Luke is technically in his 20s, um, but he acts like a teenager, so we'll just, we'll just go with it that way. And uh, they just kind of look at how their lives intersect. So Nadia, when we start the book, her mother has recently committed suicide and she is not handling things well. Her father is not handling things well either. And that's where Luke comes into the picture. Luke was a football star. He was in, uh, attending college on a full ride. They expected him to go far. And then he had a catastrophic injury and that ended his, his career essentially. Aubrey is from a very dysfunctional family. She's actually living with her sister and her sister's girlfriend or wife I'm not I'm not quite sure um, what the connection there is but it's it's one or the other she ends up moving in with them and she quickly becomes very very involved with the church it kind of becomes her saving grace it's how she pulls herself out of the trauma that she endured and then the story is just watching their lives intersect and weave through time and it just tugged on my heartstrings at various intervals I just couldn't very, very good read. Okay, next up I have a book that was 4.75 stars. This is pretty timely, although I read it before things happened. Um, the book is She Came from Maripol by Natasha Woden. This isn't a new book per se. I got it off a of NetGalley. I think, possibly, that it's recently been translated into English and that's why I was able to get an arc of it. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but this is nonfiction. Whoops. I totally, I've got to stop kicking this camera. I need to keep my feet still while I'm filming. Uh, so Natasha Woden is the daughter of two, two Ukrainians who wound up at, uh, in a German labor camp during World War II. She was born shortly after they were released from the labor camps and she, knew her mother but not really because her mother ended up committing suicide when Natasha was young 10 or 11 I think and this is kind of her story of discovering who her mother was who her mother's family was what her roots are in Ukraine and it was just so fascinating how she like through just chance almost sometimes she stumbled onto this person who happened to know things 
and then that led to something else, which led to something else, and she did, in fact, end up with a journal from an aunt, and she wound up talking to a cousin. Um, so it was just a wonderful journey to go on, and it really got me interested in learning about my roots. While I was reading this, I ordered a, a DNA ancestry, or an ancestry DNA test. <laughs> And I'm um, still waiting on my results, but that that's a thing. And then I started tracing my own family tree um, because this book just kind of inspired me. Uh, so I highly, highly recommend it. I enjoyed myself immensely. So thank you to NetGalley and the publisher for allowing me to read this book. Okay, now we're into four or five star books, and there's a lot. This is a pretty good month. Uh, first up, I have Sibylla Byrne by James S. A. Corey. This is book, I don't know, four? Four? in the Expanse series. I listened to it on audiobook. If you've been around, you know that I am rereading all the books on audio because Jefferson Mays is a wonderful audiobook narrator and I am enjoying myself immensely. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that because I'm sure you are sick to death of hearing me talk about this series. Next up, I have two books here. I'm going to talk about them together because, well, you'll see why. God, they're heavy. Okay, I have Becoming by Michelle Obama and A Promised Land by Barack Obama, and I'm going to put them down now because they're not light at all. I, I gave them both five stars. I enjoyed them equally, but differently. So, it's so weird to me because they write in very different styles, but they do it so well so well. So in Becoming, you can tell Michelle Obama is the one who's definitely more closed off and she is not as quick to open up and just tell people what she's thinking and feeling. And you can see that clearly in the book. But you can also see the honesty that she is displaying like through her words. <sighs> she's great. Oh my god, she's like such a role model to me. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. I mean, that's her, I think it's her, like, an autobiography or a memoir or something along those lines. And so you get to hear a lot about how she grew up in Chicago, and she didn't come from wealth or privilege or anything like that. She just used education as a way to further herself, and it ended up working out in the end. Um, it was also really interesting to hear about her career progression, because she had her own career, her own life, her own thing going on before she met um, Barack. And I enjoy, I enjoyed it so much. She's, she's phenomenal. She talks about how she had no interest in politics and she really didn't want to be a politician's wife, but she knew Barack had potential and great promise and that he could really make a difference. So she sucked it up. But she also, you, you follow along with her triumphs and her failures, and she's very, very honest about when she failed. Um, and that's something they, they both have in common. Like, they straight up were like, oh, and I screwed up right here. <laughs> um, which I, I appreciate. I always appreciate. Uh, Barack, on the other hand, very open. He's like a very gregarious uh, personality. And his book is, is a presidential memoir, so it's very much more focused on how he got into politics and then what was happening in the White House during the first four years of his presidency. He does get into a little bit of family stuff, um, so there is a little bit of overlap, but not, not, not so much that it's annoying. Um, but, like, he's funny. He's so funny. But the funniest bits, I thought or when he was telling stories about like conversations between him and Michelle because you don't see it in Michelle Obama's writing but she's a funny person the things she'll say to him <laughs> and then they laugh about it oh my god it was so great it was just mm, perfect I loved both of them even though especially this guy very very long but so worth reading I learned so very much and I I'd read them both again, to be totally honest with you. Okay, we're almost done. Next up we have Island Queen by Vanessa Riley, and the inside is just as beautiful as the outside. <sighs> so this is based on a true story, and it, it blew me away. So we have our main character, her name is Dorothy, 
but she goes by Dolly when she's younger. So she is the daughter of a slave woman and a white man, their, their master. Um, and she's born on this plantation in the Caribbean. I can't remember, Dominican? Wait, no. Uh, Montserrat, that's what it is. And she, oh God, she goes through it. She really goes through it, but she is strong and she is determined. And in a sense, she is a little bit lucky um, because of the white men that she does encounter and that she gets involved with. Um, or maybe it's not even luck. Maybe she just knows how to pick who she can trust. I, I'm not sure. But she ends up obtaining her own freedom. She essentially buys herself and her mom and her sister and her children. <laughs> because by the time she does this, she's in her 20s and she's already had like five kids. Um, and then during her time in slavery, how she was able to obtain the money to purchase herself was she essentially started her own business. She would train these women to become housekeepers and then she would place them in wealthy households. And she made a name for herself and she eventually expanded into hotels and whatnot. Um, I found this to be very truthful because she did own slaves because the that was essentially the only way she could continue to grow she did not want to own slaves that much is made very clear in the book whether or not that's true in real life i can't say i suspect it is simply because it doesn't make sense for her to purchase herself and her sister and her mother only to then turn around and become slaveholder herself you know like it doesn't track um, but because of how the economy worked on the Caribbean islands, it was either that or she was done. She couldn't continue to grow her empire. So right or wrong, however you want to look at it, it's what happened. She did have a system set up to where they could, you know, actually earn their money to free themselves, which in a sense might even be better because people in my experience people much prefer to save themselves than have somebody come play savior does that does that make sense um so yeah but this is just her incredible story and she was such a strong and powerful and passionate woman i i don't even i don't even have any complaints i'm gonna be honest with you i did like a quick little research on dorothy Kerwin, and from what i can tell pretty solid research was done here. Um, there's a couple things that I think the author fudged around, just dates and places to make the story, like the narrative flow, but not so much that I feel like she's misrepresenting the people and the time and the place. So I am very pleased with this book and I definitely recommend it. Last book here, and I saved this for last because we have finally found a book that made me cry. Oh yeah. And ironically, the title, is Don't Cry For Me. But I cried for him. Um, this is by Daniel Black. It is this old black man is at the end of his life and he has done wrong by his son and he knows it. His son is gay and he treated him very, very poorly and this is him looking for some kind of redemption. Um, he doesn't necessarily want his son to approve or even forgive what happened, but he wants his son to know that he tried to do what he thought was right based on what life had shown him was how he needed to parent. Does that, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly at all. So I hope, I hope that makes sense. But I, I did, I cried. Uh. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know what else to say about this because that's pretty much the story. We hear about his childhood and he talks about things he's ashamed of from his childhood. We, he talks about things he's ashamed of when, he come, when it comes to his marriage where he wasn't perfect and where he did make mistakes. And it's basically just an apology to his, to his child, his only child. I... I can't. I can't. It might make me cry again just thinking about it. So, um, yeah, I, 
this was good. This was very good. Um, it has some similarities to The Mothers by Britt Bennett, I think. You could almost call this The Fathers and that's The Mother. Anyway. Uh, but yeah, I, that's all I think I really can say. There's not much more to it than that. And it just broke my heart. So if you're going to read any of these books, please pick up this one. All right. That was February for me. I hope you guys enjoyed the wrap up. Let me know if you've read any of these books or if you're interested in reading any of these books. And as always, let me know if you had a book you particularly loved that you read in February or a book that you particularly hated. I'm down for either. I mean, we can have some good conversation. Not liking a book is not the same as not liking the author. Okay, you can hate a book, but still respect and appreciate the craft that went into it. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon. Bye.